Okay, thank you for waiting, everyone. Um, I'll now hand over to Veronique. Okay, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah? Okay, great. Okay, um, sorry about that. <laughs> so, uh, the title of the talk is Modeling the Virtual to Granular Transition in CIS. Um, I think the first thing I wanted really to say is that this is really not only my work, but the work of a group of people. They're all listed here, and most importantly, it's the work of students, which are listed in the two first rows. Okay, and I'm going to point you to their posters, which will be, I think, hanged in the, uh, the under room uh, at the end of this afternoon. Okay. Uh, Stuck. Yeah. Okay. So, what do you need to do? Um, oh. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, just a few words about uh, what we call, what I call, a rheology transition in CIs. So, we know that CIs takes a broken up aspect over a very wide, wide range of time and space scale. But we also know that once it's all broken up it can actually flow under the action of the winds and the ocean current. So this is just what I call, I like to call a transition between something that's a solid, a brittle solid, but one, once it's all broken up, it actually can flow like a fluid. Okay, so it's a brittle to fluid transition. So we've been uh, spending a lot of time in the last few years to build a model that can uh, actually uh, represent this brittle to fluid transition. Um, and the first of this model was the viscoelastic brittle rheology, or, or MEB, which is shown here. So for us, the elastic part is not really obscure. It's just the fact that if you apply a force on something, on an object, and it doesn't break or it doesn't deform right away and it stores elastic energy, then it's elastic. And in some other parts, it can be viscous because, as I said, it's broken up and it can flow. The last, the most, the most recent of this family of models, like Antoine uh, said, is the BBM rheology where we added actually a component uh, for um, a threshold for the viscous deformation and now it actually takes the form of the Bingham model so this is why it's called Bingham brittle right now but all of these models the family model share a common principle and this is accounting for the level of damage so someone asked uh, what is damage so damage by definition is something that measures the amount of fracture you have at the subgrid scale. So it's a mesoscale variable for that. Um, and actually the definition of damage is based on effective stress. And it's actually also just a measure of the degradation of your elastic modulus of your system due to fracturing the presence of cracks in it, okay? And in all of these models, we have mechanical parameters. So a viscosity and an elastic modulus that is coupled to this level of damage. And the couple goes as follow. So where the material is not too much fracture, it's almost perfectly elastic and it will break eventually. And where it's already all broken up like here, uh, actually it can undergo large deformation and behave like something that's viscous that can flow, okay? Uh, so how does it evolve in the model where when you have stresses that are overcritical with respect to a criteria, here I represented a Morcolon criteria with the threshold for the compression. When the stress are overcritical over a certain element of, of your model, then this element gets damaged. And it's damaged. When it's damaged, it cannot withstand as much stress as before. So the extra stress it cannot withstand is transferred to the other elements, the neighboring elements of the next time step. And by that, these elements can become damaged in turn, and the stress can be redistributed to other elements. So basically what damage does is it's pretty much like a domino effect. So it transmits stresses within the material, reduces reduce use stresses and allows for the zones that have a high density of cracks to propagate basically. And that leads to the formation of highly localized LKFs in the model. We also have um, a coupling to the ice concentration, which follows for, for the moment, this expression that was given by Hibber in 1979 and it goes almost the same way as damage. So it means that where the ice concentration is of almost 100%, you're almost quasi-elastic. But when the ice concentration drops, like here, then the, your, your material can actually start to flow. Okay, so 
we um, implemented these rheologies in, in a model that's called Nixon that covers the whole Arctic. Um, that's a Lagrangian model, and we perform statistical validation against deformation, lead fraction, and I won't talk about that today. I just want to point out that the newest version of the model, that's the Bingham Brittle model, uh, I've allowed us to run the model for much longer time periods, so over a few years, and get much better agreement with observations of thickness. Okay? And that has allowed us to go to the next step, so to use these rheologies in models that can, we can use at a global scale and over climate, uh, climate type simulations. And Antoine mentioned that the model is a finite element, not uh, necessarily. So now it's been implemented in other uh, numerical schemes that are more compatible with the CIS community. Uh, and that is because we want to have a fair comparison between other rheology for one thing, uh, and also for people to use the model. So here, for instance, you have an animation of the uh, field of shear deformation with the BBM model that's been implemented in the coupled sea ice and ocean model NEMO uh, CI3. Okay. Okay, so um, what I want to really talk about today uh, is what we're doing uh, in this project, um, which brings together a lot of people. And this work package that I'm leading, what we're interested in is not really to compare rheologies between them to see what does better or not, but we're really interested in trying to improve these rheologies by trying to make them better represent what happens at the small scale. And what happens at the smallest scale that are not really resolved by our continuum model is that there's other under, underlying rheological transitions. And one here is illustrated. So you have the fact that when the material is becoming damaged or is becoming fractured, then at some point, like in these shearing bands here, it also can take up the aspect of a granular material. And in this form, as a granular, the, the mechanical behavior is not dominated by fracturing anymore, but more by friction and collision between the flow. As a granular, it can also undergo what we call a jamming or the jamming transition. So basically at high density, it can actually jam and go from something that can flow as a fluid and go back to something like a, a solid. But also in sea ice, what's very important that it's that we actually have more of a de-jamming transition that happens, means that we have a material that basically was not fractured and then gets fractured and fragmented and at some point starts to look like a granular and then can flow. Okay, so this is something that we would want to better represent in our model. The granular aspect of sea ice is also very important in the marginal ice zone where then the concentration is even lower and the mechanical behavior is dominated by the fracturing due to wave and ice interaction and collision between the flows. Okay, and these are the two aspects that uh, we want to better represent in the model. So what we are gonna do is try to determine what, what are the, the very determ determinant uh, uh, processes that happen at these small scales. How can we um, translate them into meaningful mesoscale parameterization that are designed, designed to our continuum model? I'll start with the first, the first uh, granular, let's say, transition here. And for this one, uh, which is uh, a state where the, the material is granular, but very dense. Uh, so we could actually um, improve the rheology by being, uh, you know, taking the example of other existing rheology. And the most important one is, as was mentioned uh, this morning, the mu rheology. rheology. Uh, this is a rheology that was designed for, uh, from empirical, uh, an empirical point of view for idealized a granular material and it relates the shear stress to the deformation rate through a viscosity, an apparent viscosity, which is dependent on the packing fraction, which is basically the ice concentration for us. And the function that relates the packing fraction to the viscosity is a parallel, uh, a parallel uh, actually. And it actually acts a bit more, a bit like the, the formulation that Hibbler proposed, but it's just a bit more intense than what he proposed. And what it does is that it allows to the, the, the material to undergo transition between something that's a fluid and at high packing fraction, it becomes like a solid, okay? So this is one thing that the immunity rheology handles very well, but it doesn't handle well everything. For one thing, it doesn't account for the fact that the material can be highly polydispersed like sea ice. 
and for highly irregular grain shapes. So this is something that we would need to add to this rheology to be usable in terms, in terms of sea ice. And one thing that's actually very important is that it doesn't account for what happens in the material once it is in a very dense or solid phase, okay? And in that phase, we have non-local effects. The, the material is cohesive. So we're gonna have redistribution of stresses, fracturing and stuff like that. And the mutual rheology doesn't account for that at all. So what we would need to do is basically either change this rheology or try to see how we can couple it to our existing rheology, uh, which takes into account damage and concentration. But one very important thing we need to do when doing that is to ask us the question. So this is a granular representation of sea ice. Uh, what is damage in that and what, what is concentration and what what are their effect on the mechanical properties? Can we distinguish them, okay? And so to formulate this kind of rheology and to answer this question, in the perfect world, we would have all of the available observations to do that, um, but we don't. We have observations at the small scales, we have some at the large scale, but we're missing a lot of important information, which would be the mechanical resistance of a large aggregate of flow. That's very hard to observe. It's very hard to reproduce in the lab. So what we're, we're doing in the project is that we use a model as a tool to fill in the gap for this lack of observation. This model is called Flodin. It's a discrete model. Uh, it has the particularity that it can treat any, any form of flow. So it can be initialized from, from observation of flow shapes, from observation of flow size distribution. And also it tries to treat the most realistically possible uh, flow flow interaction. So it means that it tries to avoid interpretation as we have usually in other DNs model. Okay, uh, this is a small animation of of yeah of what Flodin can do. So here you just have an assembly of flow, and I think the forcing that applied here is just a, a wind vortex. So you see that the flows can move, they collide. Actually, the colors give you the um, actually the stress I think that stores in the flow so it's due to the number of collisions that they're experiencing okay so that's flowed in and so okay so one thing that we want to answer to treat the granular phase near the damming the damming transition is uh, as I said we want to couple this to our existing model which includes damage but we need to ask the question can a cohesionless uh, granular material, no, I, I wanted to say, can a, uh, yeah, a cohesionless granular material be damaged? So is damage really a relevant variable? And actually the answer is yes. And this has been known for a long time. So if the granular media is actually frictional, damage is a, re a relevant variable. So for instance, here you have a realization of uh, a force that it's a biaxial compression that's applied on a dense granular material that's cohesionless. Okay, and what you see is the formation of a shear band. Okay, and actually, what happens when you apply the a force to this material is that there's no irreversible deformation that happens at the micro scale. There's no bound breaking, there's no fracturing. But what happens is that you have some topological rearrangements of the grain, and these actually can correlate over a very large space scale, and they actually can lead to the formation of these shear bands. The formation of these Type of shear bands is accompanied by a huge softening that you can see on the stress strain response here so there's a softening and then you actually have also a, a decrease of the coordination number and what you can do is that you actually can monitor what is the effective elastic modulus or the shear modulus if you will at different moments of these kinds of experiments with the method that i will she um i will describe in one minute you can monitor the elastic modulus and you see actually that there's a degradation in elastic modulus throughout the simulation until the point of breaking. And by definition, the degradation of the elastic modulus is just damage. Okay, so yes, this material gets damage. So now we, we know that's true for a very dense assembly uh, of uh, a granular material. But now what we want to know if what happens uh, if you, we go past the, the de-jamming transition and we have a material that's not that dense and that now can flow. So what we do is that we 
uh, use floating, uh, we want to use the floating model in idealized experiments that now allow large deformations. So this is a simple shear experiment and see how it behaves. So what we get is something uh, that looks like this. So initially we have uh, an elastic loading phase and then we have a transitional phase and then we have a plateau in the mean stress. Uh, and from this plateau, we can determine something, which is the apparent viscosity. It's just the ratio of the stress to the shear strain rate. So we have a viscosity, and then we can also deduce what the elastic modulus as different moments of the simulation. And to do that, what we, we do is that we stop the simulation at different moments, and then we apply a small uh, deformation or stress amplitude to the material, small enough that the rearrangement of the grain within it are not important, but large enough that it can also to us to see if there's a history of this in the material and, and then we have stress versus strain that gives us an estimate of what is the effective elastic modulus, okay? And so with that, we get a relationship between uh, viscosity, elastic modulus, damage, and even the ice concentration or the packing fraction that we prescribe in our sample. Okay, so this is the work of uh, Orient uh, Rigotti, who's doing his PhD, and he's starting not with floating, but with an idealized model that's called LAMP, so it's a molecular dynamics model. Uh, for the moment, the material he's looking at is only by dispersed, uh, but preliminary results are that actually what he sees is that you have first an elastic phase and then a transitional phase, and when you get to the flowing phase, you need to have apparently some level of damage in the system for the damage to be able to flow. And that damage is only linked to the rearrangement of the grains, not to the ice concentration because the, the concentration is constant. Okay, so this is a, a totally different variable that we need to take into account. There needs to be a threshold of damage for the material to be able to flow, okay? So I just recommend that you see Orient's posters later. What he's gonna do later is go back to this more complex model and try to uh, understand what is the effect of grain shape, shape and polydispersity? But I think actually Agnieszka is going to talk to, to us about this a bit tomorrow. Okay, and then there's the second uh, granular phase that we want to treat, and this one is uh, associated with the, the MIZ and the wave height interaction. Okay, and again, to do that, what we would want to do is to base the formulation of our parameterization solely on observations. But we can't do that. So we have observations at a small scale. We have other observation observations of the FSD from satellite or aerial imagery at the larger scale. But the thing is, they don't give us the same answer in terms of the flow size distribution. For instance, here is a distribution that that was obtained after a breakup event um, that was uh, uh, made with a ship. So that was measured in sea ice for a single breakup event. And this is what we see if you just take an aerial picture of sea ice, okay? Uh, so the distribution here is clearly modal. Here is the power law. And the question is, how does this power law distribution emerge at, at large scale? Okay, is it because we have many fracturing events that, that occur? Is it because there is fracturing and then collision and then grinding of the flows? We, want, we would want to know that. Also, we would want to know if there's really a preferential scale for the fracturing is it the wavelength of the wave divided by two? Is it something else? And so to do that, we would need a large number of wave ice and flow interaction observations, but we don't have that. So we're gonna try to fill in the gap again using a model. Uh, so the model will be eventually uh, the flow into the model. The developments to allow that uh, are ongoing. So we're including fracturing due to flow flow contact and fracturing due to waves, but it's not ready yet. So what we're doing right now is rather use a 1D model that allows us to look at single breaking events or that, can, that we can use an ensemble runs of breaking events. That is developed by Jean-Pierre Auclair. Um, so again, another poster to look at uh, later. Okay, I'm going to describe a little bit this model. So it's just a thin elastic plate that's floating over a disturbed CI surface. So we can use um, the thin plate theory and curvilinear uh, theory to actually formulate the bending moment of this ice plate in terms of W, which is the displacement, vertical displacement, or the shape of uh, the ice plate. Okay. Uh, and by balancing the forces 
uh, the vertical forces with the forcing and the moment, we actually can get a governing equation for the shape of the flow. Here is the external body force, and our case is just buoyancy versus um, buoyancy versus gravity. So it looks like this. Uh, from this, we can actually add dimensional the add make the uh, add dimensional analysis of the equation, and we get a flexural rigidity land scale, which means that it's a land scale at which a material is. Uh, suppose in theory to break which is due only to its mechanical properties and that is mentioned in, in a lot of previous papers okay and so we solve this model and its particularity is that we actually take the liberty to include two different fracture criteria and test them both the first one is deformation based so it's based just that the maximum strength threshold is 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 reached and you break and the other one is energy based uh, so the first one is much more classical in CIS modeling, and the energy-based criteria is really classical in, in rupture or solid me me mechanics. And it just says that if you have one flow that's being bent over a wave, it has an elastic energy associated to it. But if you're breaking this flow into two parts, it also the two parts will have an elastic energy associated to them, and there's an energy associated to the fracturing. If the energy is lower in the fractured configuration than it was in the unfractured configuration, then the flow will break because you're lowering the energy of the system. Okay? So this actually is better, way much better explained in, in Sophie's poster. Okay? There's also uh, an attenuation uh, scheme added to this. Um, if you have questions on that, please ask Jean-Pierre. Um, then, okay, I'm just going to show you videos of what it gives. So the lines are basically the top of the flow, the middle and the bottom, and you have the flotation line uh, and dotted blue, the blue, dotted blue line here. So here's an example for a monochromatic front wave that enters the pack. And so you see that it breaks the ice. Um, the height is very exaggerated uh, relative to the distance. So this is why you have the impression that the flows get elongated as they move. Uh, Okay, so this is one example for a monochromatic wave, but Jean-Pierre has even better runs when he used spectral waves. And this is what it gives you. So you're basically, you're fracturing the plate, and then uh, as the wave enters, you're fracturing, the, the fracturing front enters the, the pack. And obviously what you can get from that is a size, a flow size distribution of your resulting flow. So everything I'm gonna show you now is very preliminary, uh, but we're starting to look at flow size distributions. Um, so here I'm comparing the flow size distribution for one energy, uh, for one breaking criteria, which is energy. And we have a monochromatic wave uh, compared to a spectral wave. Um, and we can see one thing is that the distribution is clearly modal in both cases. There's a difference in size between the two uh, cases due to the fact that monochrom the monochromatic wavefront will enter uh, the pack at one single point, whereas in the spectral case, you have um, dispersion of the dif different wa uh, wavelength. So it leads to smaller flow size. Mm -hmm. And one thing that we can also say, although it's preliminary, in the monochromatic case, the wavelength over two doesn't seem to be a preferential scale at all. Uh, for the flow size. Uh, in the spectral case, we cannot actually distinguish between the lambda over two, which is here, and this flexural land scale, but this needs much more sensitivity analysis to give a clearer conclusion, okay? And then uh, we can do something else. So for one type of wavefront, which is monochromatic, we can actually um, compare the two energy criteria uh, the fracturing criteria, sorry, so energy is here, deformation is here. Okay, so what we see is that we still have clearly some a distribution that's not a parallel, it's, it's modal or, or bimodal, and the deformation criteria gives us a mode here that is due to the, gener the second generation of flows, so it means that you have broken up a flow, but then it's going to break in two again after breaking one time. And there's also a difference in flow sizes, so energy criteria gives us a flow, flow sizes that are much smaller. And so with that, we just uh, calculated the mean flow size. And just for fun, we actually compared these simulations to available observations. So 
we based all of the mechanical parameters in the simulation to an observed uh, exper uh, an experiment uh, that uh, Danny and uh, Elie Dumalefebvre did uh, in real sea ice. Um, and so this is, uh, yeah, and it was a ship, uh, ship made wave, so it's almost monochromatic, so we can basically better compare these experiments to this observation. What we can see is that, uh, well, their mean size, flow size was 4.8 meters, so it seems that the deformation criteria tends to over overestimate flow size. The energy criteria does a bit better, but then does it underestimate flow size? That's a question, okay? Uh, okay, so now I'll go to some conclusions. So we want to better create what we call the brittle solid to granular transition within sea ice. The first one occurs where the ice can be very dense uh, when you have, but you have some movements such as in shear zones. Uh, so we want to better represent the jamming de jamming transition, especially in this case, uh, and formulate more physically based mesoscale parameterization of the ice strength that includes ice concentration, damage, pressure, etc. Damage does seem to be a relevant variable in that context. And then on the wave ice interaction part, so we're playing with a 1D tool model for fracturing uh, waves, uh, for fracturing ice due to wave. And uh, I think the take home mission is, is that this model is very simple and it can be scaled and compared to NC2 or lab experiments. So if you have those, you'll be very, very interested to have the data or, or, or adapt the model to your, your data or vice versa. Um, and eventually we're gonna extend this model to a 2D model because obviously there are 2Ds uh, 2D processes that are not accounted in the 1D model. And the goal is on the long term to better understand the fracturing due to wave and eventually revisit our formulation of the fracturing in the flow size distribution equation, evolution equation. Okay, so now I'll take some questions. Oh, no, I just want to remind you that there are some posters to see and more posters. Yes, these people. Okay. Okay, time for a few quick questions. Hi, Veronique. Uh, does it work? Yeah, okay. Um, do I understand that there are two uh, definitions for damage, like uh, one that's it's at, at the large scale? Do you understand that there are two definitions of damage one on the large scale uh, and one that applies to granular material? That's a very good question. I think so damage is defined basically as anything that would degrade your elastic modulus in a material. So I think we've just extended the definition of damage from being just due to cracks or being due to arrangements of the flows together. Yeah. But the definition still holds. It's just anything, you know, you have a material that can withstand some stress. If it's arranged or, or, or fractured in some way, it cannot withstand, withstand as much stress. And the ratio of these two stresses gives you basically damage. <laughs> that is a question online. I'll just read it out. Um, it's from Ellie, um, I can't pronounce that name, I'm very sorry. Uh, Ellie, do you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, perhaps you know. Um, I'm wondering if the energy threshold are depending on the value of the elastic modulus, and if so, would changing it affect the shape of the flow size distribution and its statistical moments? Yes. Um, so, yeah, the energy criteria depends on the elastic modulus. Um, and what can I say other than go see Jean Pierre's poster when you're here? <laughs> but uh, yeah, we've did, done sensitive analysis also on on the energy, the, on the energy criteria. So uh, yeah, there's a bit more information on this if you ask the right guy. <laughs> okay, we're overrunning slightly, so I think we'll move on to our next speaker now, but we can thank uh, Ron Lake again. Oh, I wish they had told me that. Uh, 